Thank you. Uh, I welcome uh, the delegates who are here in the hall, and we uh, look forward to some more people joining us. Uh, thank you, Professor Titiyal, sir, for joining us. Dr. Prakash, Dr. Arup, Dr. Saurabh, uh, myself, and Dr. Deepak Meghur will be, oh, he's already here. Wonderful. So let's have the full house on the podium. I'll invite uh, Professor Titiyal, sir, to uh, open the talk. He has to rush to another hall. So uh, Professor Titiyal needs no introduction. He is the head of RP Center, and he's been a teacher and teacher of teachers. So uh, welcome, sir, to this course. Uh, and we look forward to pearls of uh, wisdom from you regarding non-device options in small people. And anyone who's seen Professor Detail operating would know that he really does not require a device. So, so but yes, uh, uh, we have a lot to learn about uh, surgical skills. Uh, involving me in this uh, instruction course, which is, I think, very, very informative. And people do take a lot of tips for uh, improving their surgical skills. As far as small pupil is concerned, we all know that these are, you know, uh, cases which makes things very difficult sometimes on the table. And uh, we need to prepare yourself how to detect the small pupil cases, which type of pupil you have. Accordingly, we can plan surgery in these cases. It's not that I don't use devices, I do use devices, but there are certain uh, situations where you can get away without the devices also. No financial uh, disclosure from my side. So it is always important to see uh, your patient properly in a pre-op and make sure you do a good pre-op preparation for you. I understand, you know, dilatation is an important part, but maintaining the dilatation is much more important. For that, uh, if you use pre-op NSA drops, especially uh, anyone like ketal like type of drugs, that will maintain the dilatation on the table much better and also decrease the pain uh, along with that also. So that's a good complementary substitute of uh, pre-op preparation apart from the antibiotics and uh, dilat dilatation which is done on a day before. Normally we start two or three days before any NSAIDs and look for a, a pupil dilatation on the table also. On table, we know that pharmacological agents can be used, intraoperative uh, devices, techniques, intracranial medications, and ultimately the uh, hooks and expanders are required in these cases. This is a study we looked into to see if uh, OD dosing or a BD dosing required for that. And we compared, uh, we had a pharmacokinetics of uh, bromphenic drop 0.09%. And we looked into aqueous concentration of these uh, drops in a period of uh, two to three days. We started some patient five days before, some patient three days before, some two days before, and some just one day before. We realized both OD and BD dosing are good enough to maintain the aqueous concentration on the table when you actually do the surgery. And it is a good way to initiate. If you are doing a OD dosing, it has to start at least 24 hours before. If you are doing BD, it can be done the same day also. These are various intracameral solutions which are available nowadays to maintain a dilatation. Mainly, there will be a phenylephrine uh, or lidocaine combinations so that you have a good dilatation as well as the pain can be decreased in these cases. I normally use uh, simple uh, intracameral epinephrine, preservative free, with a dilute, dilute, dilution of around 1 to 1000. And that gives a very nice dilatation of uh, most cases which you handle with. But sometimes people may, may, not, may not dilate and may require an no expanded device as such. Then high molecular weight viscoelastic is required in these cases, especially during the uh, capsular excess uh, stage where you want to maintain the entire uh, space and use of uh, these OBDs can also you know, expand the pupil during your surgery also. So this is what I say, I need to, we need to know what type of pupil I'm dealing with. Is it a floppy pupil or it is a rigid pupil? So that is important. So this around, this is around 4.5 millimeter dilatation. Good dilatation, you can do surgery effectively in these cases. So you can see here, I'm doing uh, my two side pores, a main wound. Now when I'm going to inject a viscoelastic, I realize this pupil is not fully dilated or complete. You can see this turbulence in the pupillary margin here. So this tells you that pupil requires some sort of a expansion with the midriatic. So I'm injecting under the viscoelastic little bit of epinephrine and see how beautifully pupil dilates. So this is a case you won't require any subsequent devices. You can maintain the entire dilatation and complete your surgery also. 
the idea to show this video is you should always know the floppy pupil and use of uh, intracameral devices in terms of uh, intracameral medications and make sure your surgery is uneventful without handling the iris tissue access. The surgery went very, very effective clearly in this particular case. So this is one case which is a rigid pupil. Though it's around 2.5 millimeter. You can see I'm doing incision here. So both incisions are done and at this stage is important. Two things are important. One is uh, maintaining the dilatation. I'll use intracameral also. That will not make any significant difference in the pupil size. So when I'm doing manipulation, the pupil will not flutter also. If the pupil doesn't flutter, this will maintain the dilatation till the end of your surgery. So this is a visco uh, exp expansion of pupil you can see here. So this is around now 3 millimeters. So I can do rexis uh, with that. And if needed, you should stain this pupil. I am doing without staining also, but staining will always give you a better access to peripheral edge of a tearing which is happening in these cases. So when you are doing rexis, you must see where exactly tearing is happening. And the flap rotation is also very important. You all are expert in doing capsular rexis. And flap rotation tells you that you are in a correct uh, Please, if your flap doesn't rotate properly, that is a time you may have to use an expanded device, especially iris hooks, to see where your flaps are going. I'll do hydro uh, dissection now, and uh, subsequently I'll complete FACO also. Once I've done a good hydro dissection, the idea here is to not to go too peripheral, because the pupil is small, but sometimes you can catch the uh, pupil in margin with your FACO, and that will immediately constrict the pupil, and things will become difficult here. So you have to have moderate parameters. IOP is I keep normally higher in these cases. If you keep too low, then things can be some difficult also. And only use a torsional FACO to complete this FACO. So take out the loose epicortex first, then go uh, onto the actual matrix of the nucleus. At this stage, you can see I'll go by uh, make a small trend so that uh, chopping can be easier, and your hole will be a little deeper. So doing a direct chop in a very small pupil can be difficult sometimes because you have to go blindly to the peripheral area. So once you have a little trench here, now the space is there to hold the nucleus. Good hold now and you can chop it. So this is one, uh, I think, important tip. If you make a stronger hole, management can be easier in the small pupil also. Sometimes the nuclear rotation can be difficult because your hydro procedure may not be complete. In that process, you have to take out uh, small small uh, pi and this space will be now allow the fluid to seep into uh, between the endonucleus and epicortical cushion and subsequently your nucleus rotation may be possible you have to be a little more patient in dealing with the, such a situation because you don't want to damage the pupillary margin or handle the pupillary margin otherwise the pupil will constrict again so this is how we can complete now i'm left with a half this half can be rotated back and subsequently, you can complete the FACO also. You can see the pupil did not change at all. So this is a rigid pupil. So you can still manage such cases. If this would have been flopping, the pupil would have constricted and surgery would have been difficult and you would have required to put a device of like iris hooks or expander at this stage also. You can remove the epicortex and complete the surgery. The idea here is to, if you have a rigid pupil, then you can complete the surgery like this also. So sometimes you have a difficulty cases with the premium IVL, especially toric IVLs. So this is a little floppy pupil. You can see the pupil is fluttering when I'm actually going inside the entry chamber. I've injected little epinephrine. Now I have complete 4.5 millimeter rexis. And you can complete the FACO effectively. So in a small pupil, it is important to have a visibility of your toric marks. So which I'm showing here, complete the FACO. Aspirate to the bimanual, inject the viscoelastic, and just place the eyewell inside. So here it is important to have a visibility of these three dots in the optic haptic junction of toric eyewells, at least in a one area. Make sure to remove the viscoelastic effectively in these cases, and subsequently plan. If you have image guided devices, you can always have this thing. You can see, I can see these three dots here. It is well aligned. I can't see here, but it doesn't matter. It will, lens will be well placed. So if you don't see these three marks, then you require, you know, expanded devices at that time also. Just a small brief, uh, this is the floppy uh, iris uh, syndrome case. You can see the pupil, this is getting distorted because in the side port, this pupil is coming there. What I do, I remove this uh, second instrument and put the bolus of a dispersive viscoelastic, which will maintain the space there because it will not come out. 
तो यू कैन पुट हेयर ऑल्सो यू कैन हेयर ऑल्सो एंड देन आई कैन कम्प्लीट माई इंटायर सर्जरी तो समटाइम्स मेनटेनिंग द प्यूपली डायरेटेशन विद द डिस्पर्सिव बिस्को लास्ट बिकॉज दैट रिमेन्स दर इज नॉट अ बोलस डजेंट कम आउट तो दिस इज वट आई कम्प्लीट सर्जरी दिस पेशेंट ऑल्सो तो टेक ऑफ मैसेज इन अ स्मॉल प्यूपल इज यू शुड मेनटेन द डायरेटेशन बाई प्री ऑफ एन एसेट and detect the floppiness of pupil and inject epinephrine to see if the pupil dilates well if the pupil is rigid and size is beyond 3.5 mm you can complete the surgery effectively in these cases and use of a low fluidics and bimineral aspiration goes long way in maintaining the you know integrity of a anterior segment that is basically a posterior capsule and not damaging the pupil or iris structures thank you for kind listening thank you very much professor tejal sir uh Uh, if there's any question for Professor Tithial, you can uh, shoot them now because he'll be leaving for another course in another hall. There's a question; he'll be happy to take it. Yes, yeah, please. please take the flow mic, please. Okay, yeah, the flow mic. No, 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 mic, uh, mic, mic. Low fluidics. Uh, exactly how it means uh, aspiration. So basically, to... your uh, uh, your flow means you know you have a uh, inflow and outflow in these cases. so two things are important you have to keep uh, your flow rate little moderate so that uh, you don't have too much of uh, fluttering happening in the anterior chamber you make sure incisions are such a uh, manner done the outflow from the incisions are not much so you are making a side port it should be guarded side port so that fluid doesn't come out from there and make your incision little anterior so that you have flap the iris will not come into your port if you have floppy iris your incision are too posterior the iris will come to immediately into the port area so little anterior little longer uh, tunnel and making your side port incision such a manner where your in the instrument is not normally moderately fitting to that it should not be too loose otherwise a lot of fluid will come out and that will cause turbulence in the anterior chamber so keep a little f- low flow rate normally my flow rate is 34 to 40 here i'll go down to around 27 to 34 so that you don't have too much of fluctuation thank you sir thank you Thank you very much, sir, for being part of the course every year. Look forward to it next year. Yes, sir. yes, sir. look forward to it. Thank you, sir. Okay, now it's my privilege to invite uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Prakash Choudhury from uh, Chittagong, Bangladesh, a good friend of ours, and uh, he's been uh, visiting our conference quite often. Uh, so, welcome, Dr. Prakash. Let's hear from you. This is a key keynote uh, lecture being delivered by uh, Dr. Prakash Choudhury. pulse uh to deal with the uh, cataract with a small pupils so the surgical challenges with the small pupils is visualization is compromised and it is very difficult to create optimum size axis and that affects all steps of the faco surgery starting from the capsular axis to the iol implantations as a consequence it demands prolonged surgical time and there is more chance of damage to the other intraocular structures the there are variant types of small pupils some are elastic and that is due to the diffuse atrophy of the dilateral muscles and loss of muscle tone and mostly we found it in the ifis and then some are rigid non elastic and due to this fibrosis and atrophy of the constrictor pupillae which is mostly common with the pseudo expulsion syndromes and the characteristic uh, so it is very important to distinguish the elastic from the non elastic rigid pupils the characteristic features of the elastic pupils are Uh, the dancing and fluttering movements of the iris during the irrigations and people expands momentarily with the injections to ovt but again returns to its normal size on the other hand the rigid pupils they do not dilate uh, with the injections so ovt they only dilate after stretching the pupils so first at first i will uh, share my surgical past to deal with the small pupils with all pupil expansion device and these are the my surgical pass yeah, i use uh, intercamular myadiatis and cohesive ability to improve the dilatation of the pupils i do enter capsule stain with tipen blue routinely under soft shell technique to improve the uh, to make complete dexis more confidently and safely 
It is very crucial to make optimum size capsular axis. Judicious multi-quadrant hydrodesensions is very good uh, idea uh, so that the fluid pressures cannot build up behind the iris. If it is increased pressure build up behind the iris, that will cause the iris prolapse and will make the pupil small. Slow motion FECA with torsional ultrasonic is very important because with the slow motion FECO, the turbulence will be less. Because with increased turbulence, the pupil cells will be calmed down and slow motion FECO also useful to stay viscoelastic substance during the procedure. And it is very important to inject OBD before removal of the instrument to maintain the stability of the anterior chamber, which is very crucial to maintain the size of the pupils. <coughs> and bimanual IA is more effective than the coaxial IA because it greatly maintains the stability of the anterior chamber and I will insertion under cohesive OBD is, is another important thing. So in this clinical video, we can see the after making the side port, I first inject the uh, intercamerular myodiatis to improve the dilatation of the people. Then I inject the dispersive OBD followed by cohesive OBD and ideal soft shell technique. Here I am uh, straining the anterior capsules under soft shell technique. And the main advantage of this technique, it does not allow the anterior chamber and pupil to get uh, collapse. And now I am proceed to uh, make a optimum size rexis as large as possible. Here I am following the pupillary margin to achieve the large rexis. And most important is the during hydro dissections, the, the you have to, uh, the judicious amount of fluid you have to use and immediately after injection of the fluid, I immediately decompress the people so that the fluid pressures cannot build up behind the iris. And uh, to deal with the nucleus, I first uh, try to do enough deep scouting which is a period, which is to divide the nucleus into multiple small fragments. Here notice my inflow is very low. My motor height is only 50 centimeter and corresponding I have also very low aspiration flow rate, but I am using the optimum amount of ultrasounds uh, <coughs> to uh, deal, to make the sculpting, and deep sculpting. And during chopping also, I use very low inflow because when the tip is occluded, uh, to create the become there is only inflow there is no outflow so if i keep my inflow very high and that will create increased pressure behind the iris and that will cause this iris prolapse and during fragment removal it is very important to uh, maintain the optimal fluidic parameters so we have to always keep in mind the input must be matched with the outputs and slow motion for the torsional ultrasound is very useful the great advantage of the torsional ultrasound it has outstanding followability which is uh, very crucial to deal with the cataract with the small papers and before take out the FACO probe, I inject in dispersive of the other side port to maintain the stability of the anterior chamber which is very crucial to maintain minimize the uh, uh, size here I'm using the bimanual IA to remove the cortex because irrigation and aspiration handpiece are separate so it greatly maintain the stability of the anterior chamber which is also again very crucial to maintain the size of the people during this procedure. And here I'm injecting the cohesive OBD through the side port before I will implantations to create better space. And these are these cohesive movements are highly entangled with each other so they are also very easy to remove from, uh, from the eye. And Removal of OBD from behind the aisle is also very important because if any OBD left behind, that will cause high rise of intercooler pressure post-operatively. But the, if the cataract is very challenging one and visibility is compromised, in that case, it is wise to use the people expansion device to achieve wide surgical stable fields and to prevent interoperative complications. So there are some, though there are some drawbacks, it may cause the uh, more inflammation, more chance of CMO and there is a more chance of post operative high rise of intercooler pressures. And these are the common people expansion device we use, ID soak and ring device. Uh, ring device, this uh, commonly we use the BHEX ring, the uh, Dr. Shubhan Bharacharya is the uh, creator of this uh, uh, ring. And uh, the main advantage of the ring device, there is no need of extra parasynthesis and they, it less, it um, less time consuming and post operative people distortion is less. But they are not as, as strong as iron hook because they only support the pupillary margins. On the other hand, here you can see the pupil is non-dilating rigid pupil. So uh, first I stress the pupils, then I place the BX uh, ring, uh, and then I inject the cohesive under the iris. Uh, and after being that, the plunges, the plunges with the holes, there is a tuck under the iris. And the best part of this BX ring is very easy to remove. And you see after uh, removing, after implanting the BX ring, the pupil is widely dilated and I complete the surgery very successfully and take out the BX ring from the eye. 
here it is a complicated with the posterior sign so intercamular mitral will not be affected over here so to dilate the people's cohesive body and as well as 360 degree synecoalysis is very crucial in this case here i am doing i am breaking the uh, additions through the side put to the spatula injecting cohesive down the diaries just to lift the diaries margins and now i am using the behexing uh, to uh, achieve the stable surgical fields and here you can see the the behexing there are six planges three planges uh, with hole and three planges there is no hole and there are six notches so Flanges with the hole, they tuck under the iris, and alternately the flanges with that hole, they place above the iris, and notches are engaged to the iris margins. And here, visibility also is very compromised because it's a uh, big compromised size. And now you see through the side port, I disengage the BXNs from the pupillary margins, then easily it's taken out. You can take it through the side port also. Here it is a, here you can see it is a uh, white intumescent cataract here, making axis is very challenging so over here. So we need to, uh, we, we demand actually a stable surgical pill, power operative. So I, uh, here I am doing the double uh, stress capsule axis after making the initial mini axis. Now I am decompressing the people by taking out the thick sole and cortex. And here I am giving the tangential cut. Then I am enlarging the pupils to optimum size. Uh, it is a hard cataract also. So the pupil expansion device are very useful in the when you deal with the some challenging cataract, demanding cataract, and even demands uh, stable surgical fields even, uh, so that there is no iris prolapse during the operations. The the main drawbacks of the iris hooks it demands extra paracentesis, it demands more time, and it is mostly useful in the severe IFS power operative meiosis and suspected zonular laxity and peri peripheral axis tear. But, and, but the advantage is it is the strongest one and because it fixes the iris with the limbus. Here you've seen the pupil is well dilated before operations and after making the side port and when I inject the lignocaine and you see the pupil is greatly, very small. So I manage the pupil with the uh, uh, iris hooks. Here you can see again there is interoperative meiosis. So uh, after injecting the cohesive down at the iris, I enlarge the people with the people expansion device. And now it's easy to me uh, to remove the cortex with the bimanual IA. And now I, this is a patient's uh, plan for to implant the multifocal eye well. So after being that, I implant the multifocal eye well. Here you can see during tucking the BX thing under the iris, there is a axis tear at the periphery. So what I did, I removed the BX rings and I uh, put the uh, iris hooks to see the peripheral extension of the tear. And I completed the axis in the anti-clockwise direction. It is quite periphery. The axis tear was in the quite periphery and then successfully managed the case. And here is a traumatic cataract, and there is a peripheral extension of the tear after injection of the ovary. So to assess the peripheral extension of the tear, I put the four, uh, I, that is iris hooks, and the, it is a periodic cataract, traumatic cataract, the uh, capsules is very elastic. So uh, I, anyhow, I manage the axis, uh, and I give a tangential cut over other sides, and complete the axis with the, uh, the micro axis forceps. Here it is planned for to implant the secondary apple. There is a uh, anticapsules. You see in the six, seven o'clock, there is a anticapsules also uh, not in text. So I, uh, by using the iris hook, I managed the case. Thank you so much for patience hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prakash. Uh, a, a real comprehensive view of the entire uh, uh, gamut. And uh, in fact, he's, you've touched upon practically every aspect of other, what other speakers will be speaking. And I uh, look forward to you joining us for the discussion as we go forward. Uh, uh, now, it's my privilege to invite uh, Dr. Arup Chakravarti. Uh, again, he knows it requires no introduction. He's uh, been a trainer, a teacher, uh, and in fact, a mentor to me also. Uh, so we look, look forward to hearing from Dr. Arup Chakravarti on certain basics of iris hooks and IFIS which is a bigger issue. Uh, so, Dr. Arup Chakravarti, please. So, uh, good morning, friends. Uh, congratulations, uh, Suvan, for uh, running this course so successfully for such an extended period of time. IFIS, Iris Hooks, I think is a very interesting topic because if 
you have not used an iris hook in a properly selected IFIS. Okay. Okay, uh, because of these technical issues, uh, our chief instructor, Dr. Suen Bhattacharji, will be speaking uh, about his own invention. Ye wala ka, DJ, please. And uh, about okay, the yeah. other pupil expanders as well. So, over to yeah. Dr. Can Swain. I have my audio just, please, audio on, audio on, please? I'll just check my audio. Audio on, hai? Ah, yes. Fine. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Again, yeah. So, uh, now my topic is speaking on BHEX and other people expanders. So, we are expecting iris hooks earlier, but then uh, you'll hear about uh, iris hooks later. So, as a courtesy to other people expanders, what I'll do is we'll have other people expanders and iris hooks first, and then I'll talk about the BHEX. <clears throat> and I do have a financial interest in the BX people expander and management devices uh, as a uh, owner director. Now, with Iris Hooks, I'll briefly go through the issues with Iris Hooks. We've been using Iris Hooks for a very long time. All of us have used it. Uh, I myself have uh, contributed to the development of the same also. But the big problem is you are wasting a lot of corner space. Anything outside that circle is actually wasted space. Outside the capsule is the place where we don't require anything. And the second thing is that it gets the pupil plane is elevated to the limbus. So that cramps your space in the antechamber. And there is been this study in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery which says that iris hooks take a little longer time, whether it's uh, experienced surgeons or novices. And of course, if it's a tight situation and you've got a lot of IFIS, you may have bad marks on the iris, which may not be cosmetically very pleasant. Now, the problem with Malugan, which has been the standard of care, is that it is a biplanar device. It requires a little skill in loading and withdrawing and injecting it. There is a learning curve. You require a manipulator. And the biggest problem is removal. While you can have the skills to uh, insert it, now that's the company video itself, so <clears throat> absolutely flawless. And the last uh, uh, scroll is tucked in and the pupil margin is engaged. Now that's fine so far, but you look at the, when you try to remove it, look at the two scrolls at the distal and proximal part. Now when you, the engaging it to and into the uh, injector itself to remove it is a little bit of a challenge and then you look at those two arrow marks and you see how the pupil margin is getting crushed over there and that is a very nasty situation that's a very intimidating situation for any surgeon so the problem stems from the fact that the malugan ring Stroke is a biplanar device can we have the order? and act as a compression spring too and hence can crush or release the iris unpredictably it is fundamentally wrong to attempt inserting a biplanar scroll through a slit incision. That is why an injector is required to prevent snagging of the incision. So, can you please keep that volume over there? And the problem is with the Malugan ring is that it's now it's a spring. So, it's a spring which has got a uh, uh, moves in both directions. So, it's actual torsional as well as actual spring. So, that's where it causes the crushing. Now, this is another video by Tom Oting uh, from the University of Ot Iowa, and this was uh, produced, and this actually tells you the real story about the Mulligan ring and the teething problems that people had. You look at that, that, that was the time when Mulligan rings used to break while withdrawing. It's got a glued joint, so it, that possibility always remains, uh, remains inside the eye, and that could be a very nasty situation. Now, then... <clears throat> it part of it curls and you know kind of snags in the incision and here this it's it's a very nasty situation where you have it got stuck with the iris and you just can't remove it so it had to be cut and removed now the next is the asia people expander now this looks a little gross in the entry chamber it's a bulky device engaging is difficult uh, and so it's not really uh, stood the test of time and hasn't had great acceptance uh, it's it's really a little cumbersome uh, this is the expand NT speculum uh, but 
again this was uh, with the forceps it's very difficult to use it it's a challenge over here so they themselves modified it and that's the reason why all pupil expanders require an injector and that's the very re same reason that the bh does not require an injector because these are biplanar devices and the bh is a planar device or a uniplanar device this is the expand nt so they since they have a struggling with that they move to the injector and now you see what happens with the injector it's a nitinol ring so it's a metal ring so it doesn't have that smoothness it's pretty jerky and difficult to uh, control so again this hasn't been very successful in the global market Beaver Visitech came out with the eye ring uh, and this has been there in the market but again it's got a large vertical profile and the anterior chamber can be looking very intimidating and if it's a shallow anterior chamber it uh, uh, can uh, be a bit tight for space. Canabrava rings is P PMMA. PMMA really doesn't have much of a place in the current day because they, it's a fairly rigid thing and well you might get away with a, a case or two but it does not have the versatility to go around and in all the surgeries that we require. So this has again has not uh, been a great uh, a success. So this is a survey we conducted in August 2020, right? We were when we were coming out of COVID, and that was the time when people were willing to uh, respond to surveys. And it was very heartening for me to see that the BHEX people expander was at 42% usage compared to Iris Hooks at 41. That's a neck-to-neck -neck competition. Uh, yes, maybe the, we did not have a very large uh, uh, response set, but and if you look at compared to the other devices, we, the BHEX was far ahead. Now, BX is a very simple device, single, simple planar device, and it is extremely thin, 0 0.075 millimeters, that's 75 microns. It's one tenth the thickness of any device available and are extremely flexible, resiliently flexible. That's the, pro that's the property we look for in a device. And this is the forceps that we recommend, the BX 23 gauge forceps. It's uh, ergonomically designed for use with this uh, device. So the basic difference within the BX and the Malugin ring or other rings that have been there, it's the planar, the, bi the, the, the Malugin ring or other devices engage the pupil margin. It's a biplanar structure, whereas BX, the notches are flat and the same plane. So the iris bends at the notches and the device remains at the same plane. So you just need to tuck alternate flanges under the pupil margin and you have a wonderful hexagonal pupil. And the beauty is that you, uh, it really is so thin that you don't feel its presence in the anterior chamber and that allows you a lot of flexibility and room in the anterior chamber to go ahead. Removal, you could use the main port or the side ports and uh, it is really easy, one of the easiest devices to remove. So this is the 23 gauge forceps that we recommend. Now this is, you could use any incision, um, hitherto I used to say that you could use 1.8 to 2.2 because there are a lot of surgeons who still use a 1. Point, I mean like love to use comics, uh, so they use 1.8 millimeters incision and well it just walks in through a 1.8 incision and tucking the flanges is absolutely easy, it comes intuitively to any eye surgeon and <clears throat> we have used micro forceps for a long time and it's uh, very easy. Now see the small space that you have in the antechamber for movement of that phaco probe so your nuclear fragments can move around and you can move around the probe the IA probe see the excursion of the IA probe and the device really does not come in the way that is a huge plus when you are working in a small place like uh, the anterior chamber uh, again insertion of the IOL has is absolutely uh, easy because of uh, the space at the, the it doesn't come in the way of the injector nozzle and removal through the main incision is absolutely easy it's a walk in the park now, given that, and you get a lovely round people at the end of surgery. Now, this is what I presented at the ASCRS just concluded on a back day for yesterday. Now, this is, you can insert the BHEX through a 1.2 millimeter incision. No device that means no, no people expanded known to mankind has been able to go through such a small incision. Yes, we need to uh, orient the flanges, the, hold the leading flange at the end of it and then it goes in very easily through a 1.2 incision and that we are probably uh, ready for an unmet need which is there right now as well as we are future ready. If you look at the, the removal, now again the removal is so so easy, it's as thin as a human hair so you can just hold it through the side port, disengage it and you can remove it through the side port which is 0 0.9 millimeters. No other device has achieved this feat. 
So the another huge advantage that we found these days, especially in India, we've seen that surgeons are moving towards hydro implantation, that is implantation of the IOL without any OVD. That's where the BX again, you can just hold that irrigation with a low flow in the in the through side port and you can remove the BX easily. How big do you want the pupil to be? Now, this is a question people have asked. So, 5.5 is very good. BX provides that. And even with iris hooks, I would recommend you don't do any more than that. So, this is a wonderful video by Dr. Deepak Magur, who's over here on stage with us. <clears throat> He's a great educator. So, you see this. It's a pretty hard cataract. And the BX provides a 5.5 pupil. All you need to do is chop that uh, cataract into small fragments, and you can get away with any hardness of cataract. It's really not such a big deal. So, now intraoperative meiosis. This is BHEX is probably the safest device when you have you caught sub by as a surprise and the pupil comes down on you. Now, what you need is the problem with the malugin ring is that you, the the uh, scrolls, the openings in the scrolls on the sides, so you do not get a clear view from a top uh, on a top view. So you are not very sure whether you're engaging the capsule margin or the pupil margin. Now, the BHEX because the notches are facing you, you are absolutely sure, and as you engage the pupil margin and draw it to the periphery, you have absolute instant confirmation that you have not engaged the, people, uh, the capsule margin. And welcome to the 20th and there is no annual bigger honor than this. AAO Spotlight on Cataract Complications. And this ring is very popular uh, in Asia, I believe, and in some European countries. And again, it's FDA approved. And he calls it the B-hex uh, ring. And it's really, really thin. So this ring uh, comes out really easy. It's flimsy, it's thin, uh, and we uh, pull it right out. There couldn't be a more better encouragement than Dr. David Chang endorsing the ring. And this again is on the American Academy website. This is a wonderful video by Professor uh, Deepak Edward and uh, Michael Henry. And this is on uh, BX being used in a tube shunt case, which is actually uh, a common problem these days. And these have shallow eye, shallow anterior chambers, and multiple comorbidities. So getting around that uh, tube shunt is it's pretty easy with the BX. No other device would allow you that uh, flexibility and versatility. Uh, this has been used widely in posterior segment surgery also. This is an award-winning video by Dev Dulal Chakraborty, and I won't go into the details, but it's available on YouTube. <clears throat> so what your pupil expander would be depend upon how you wish to tear a rigid pupil. So <clears throat> it's, if it's an elastic pupil, you can get rid of with any device. If you want to tear a fibrotic pupil with the device, you will need a bulky device like the Malugin or others. And But <clears throat> with the BX, you can use a stretch and then do that. These are publications, and I would encourage you to look up this, uh, which is available on our website. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, now I'll invite Dr. Arup, you are ready? Yeah. So can I invite Dr. Arup Chakravarti to talk to us about the iris hooks? I think probably just one. Uh, you have start. Uh, what we have seen is that the learning curve with BHEX is very, very short. I, even the young beginners can, you know, begin with a very successful attempt. Yes, I think that's a very valid point, uh, Dr. Saurabh. We have not had a single hands-on wet lab with the BHEX. And the best part is not many people are asking for it also. They just see videos and go get away straight away. And of course, we've got wonderful educators. We've got so many YouTube videos that I just have to forward them the link to the video and they can see and they are just off the uh, this thing, uh, track. Good morning, friends. Uh, thank you, Suvin, uh, for giving me an opportunity to participate in this uh, program, which has been going on for quite some time. Uh, the topic allotted uh, by Suvin is IFIS and iris hooks. Uh, these are uh, related topics because see, if you see this case, if I had been, if I had used an iris hook right from the beginning, I would not have resulted, it would not have resulted in a, having a graphic video, what you see here. Incidentally, this video is more than 15, 16 years old, and I don't have possession of any such videos in my practice for IFIS candidates because I've been using the proper preoperative uh, uh, measures and uh, intraoperative uh, decisions have been appropriately made to avoid a scenario like this. So I would start off with a, a little bit of current concepts about IFIS, how the concept has evolved. You know, since it was, in, it was uh, the concept was published first time by Campbell and Chang in 2005, we have been classifying small pupils into two categories. There's IFIS, non-IFIS type, that is the traditional types of uh, small pupil, and the IFIS type of small pupil. 
and it is also important to remember that there may be a lot of overlap in this okay so ifs type of small people basically are uh, classically male patients it can also be seen in female with benign prostatic hyperplasia on treatment with alpha 1 air antagonistic drugs and uh, there have been of course other systemic associations which have not been really proven patients with hypertension patients with uh, on antipsychotic medications etc etc uh, coming back to patients with benign prostatic hypertrophy so initially all these patients used to be put on non specific uh, alpha blockers terazosin doxazosin because of systemic complications like hypertension they were uh, given up and then we uh, the focus of, of the urologist made then shifted to the specific and the uh, uh, uroselective uh, 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 antagonists so that was classical example of tamsulosin when it was started people really did not know what are the side effects it could have because of uh, the receptors present in the iris tissue the smooth muscles of the iris tissue then we realized from this publication that it was uh, ifis that can that was happening so subsequently you know uh, uh, if we are dealing with a fake patient who requests treatment with an alpha antagonist it should be uh, alfuzosin actually it is a non selective blocker but it is has such a very slow systemic absorption profile that you know it doesn't give us to postural hypertension uh, over the course of time it has been proven that silodosin and uh, dutasteride finasteride they all have been associated with higher incidence of bph so this is the list that we have put up in our clinic now uh, i would uh, since its uh, description uh, for the first time in 2005 uh there have been two meta analyses that have come see all of us deal with ifis patients and we have anecdotal experiences some of them are published but they didn't give a true picture so these two meta analyses uh, studies and uh, published at an interval of 10 years have shown us that you know have confirmed few things that male sex is more predisposed to developing ifis hypertension people with decreased dilated pupil ray diameter as well as the intuitive pupil diameter ratio uh any type of alpha antagonist particularly tamsulosin finasteride and antipsychotic medication so if if there has been clear cut evidence in the literature that these are definitely you know uh, agents or 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 uh, factors that predispose a patient to ifis so uh, there has no unfortunately there has been you know we have been taking prophylactic measures like discontinuing tamsulosin when possible or use of topical atropine using intracameral epinephrine preoperative topical anesthetics but based upon this meta analysis there's no justification as to what exactly is the best way of dealing with uh, this situation uh we have realized that if the pupil doesn't dilate well preoperatively the patient may be an ifis candidate there have been various studies showing any any dilatation less than 8 mm 7 mm 6.5 mm measurement of this may be cumbersome so what i normally do in my practice is you know i take the intuitive pupil to limbal diameter say for example this particular patient now i do it for all my patients this is just an example here the dilated the pl ratio is uh, 0.58 so this is a candidate for ifis so if i feel that i can do a safe rexis and fellow i has done well now i would use intraoperative and uh, in, intracameral uh, agents like this and in case i feel that pupil is very small to start with comorbidity is present i would be using uh, one of these devices and i'll be talking to you about iris hooks today so let me show you uh, uh, some videos see use of iris hooks in, in the setting of ifis is not different from a routine uh, small pupil scenario so normally the packet comes with five uh, hooks you could use five hooks in a rhomboid type a, a pentagon type or you can use a you know as a rectangular a square uh, there you can just use the ordinary instruments you know the suture tying forceps and macpherson forceps or, or needle holders or some specific devices also could be used now see it is important to make the paracentesis stretch extremely well very carefully i must be pressurized it should not be soft so that the entry is smooth it must have very sharp razor blades don't go too much to the periphery through the conjunctiva because you you'll have difficulty inserting the iris hook don't go into the central cornea because then in that case the peripheral ac becomes really very very shallow and the entry into the anterior chamber here is more and you know, slant more you know, vertical rather than slanting what you do for a paracent for side port incision every time i i make a paracentesis i inject ovd to pressurize the intra, the eye don't make it very small to start with because if it is very small you may struggle with entry of the iris hook and it may damage uh, the mechanical properties of the iris hook and subsequently i have noticed cases where you do develop a lot of stromal hydration so i have a decent opening which just enables you to go into the anterior chamber 
Now, this particular case, of course, does not require an iris hook in a routine scenario. But this patient had pseudo exfoliation and intumescent cataract. And wherever I feel that I may have to uh, work in the peripheral area of the, of the lens, I would use a pupillary device. So, this case definitely it is indicated. So, first step is you make the paracentesis track. Second track is insert all the four or five devices into the anterior chamber. Don't engage at this stage. And then you start engaging uh, very carefully. While engaging, you may like to, you know, to elevate the iris by injecting a little bit of uh, cohesive OVD under the iris, so it makes it easier. The engagement uh, b between the iris hook and the pupillary diameter, pupillary ring, may be, may be difficult if it is a very deep eye. It may also be difficult when it is a mid-dilated scenario. In that case, you have to work really vertically, uh, so that may be difficult. So what you have seen me do here is engage the four hooks and then I will expand the iris uh, to a desired uh, size. I would like to go for a larger uh, pupillary size if I'm dealing with an intumescent cataract, very swollen cataract, or a very hard cataract where I feel that I may be required to work in the peripheral area. Uh, there are certain precautions that you need to follow that uh, say, for example, when you're inserting your uh, FACO handpiece or any device into the anterior chamber, make sure that iris hooks are relaxed, the stoppers are you know, pulled up a little bit so that as the phaco tip in, enters the anterior chamber, it does not hit the iris tissue. Likewise, uh, if uh, during the uh, ion intraocular lens insertion also, you could do the same thing so that the lens in leading haptics, they do not impinge upon the iris and you don't have unnecessary or that avoidable iris trauma. I have seen videos in the YouTube where there have been a lot of problems related to this. In fact, long, long ago when I start, started using iris hook, I had an iris root tear a lot of hemorrhage with cleared up. So there are certain difficult situations, you know, there are certain complications that can happen. Paracentesis may, may be too central, it may be too peripheral, it may be too close to the incision. So all these things can happen. And generally, by and large, you know, though you get little uh, dilated pupil postoperatively, most of the Indian patients do not complain of any dysphotopsic uh, symptoms or do not have any, 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 any problems related to aesthetics. So these are certain advantages of iris retractors over expanders. You know, you can use it in uveitic bound on ectopic pupils. Rings can maybe, you know, may not really serve the purpose in th those situations. You can give use it selectively. For example, in patients with uh, post vitreatine eyes, you know, you can engage an iris hook at one paracentesis to prevent the re reverse pupillary block. It can be used safely in ephecic vitreatine eyes because you have these anterior chambers becoming very deep from time to time. And then, you know, the, if it is a ring device, it may dislocate posteriorly. So if I hook, it doesn't happen. It can be safely placed after capsulatum is fashioned. Of course, you need to take precautions. It can be removed without OVD, and that is an advantage in uh, toriacal situations. It can provide counter-traction during rexis formation in uh, zonulopathy. So these are all the, you know, advantages of iris hooks. Why you prefer to use an iris hook in my routine practice? In addition to, of course, Suvens device is a beautiful device, and uh, I mean, uh, we have been very happy with that. And uh, I mean, I, uh, you can, uh, if you're using a capsule retention segment, you can hold it during phaco emulsification through the eyelet of the, of the segment. And it can be also used to assist in iris repair. So these are some of the advantages of iris hook. And they can be used at, even if uh, the pupil comes down intraoperatively, you can use the device. It, it's not that you have to start off with this device and you can't use it intraoperatively. There are certain precautions to be followed, which I have discussed. And if you select the patients judiciously, is a proper technique. I think the results are going to be excellent. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Suvin. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arup. Uh, very comprehensively covered large topics, IFIS and iris hooks. And of course, I would always say that every surgeon should be equally proficient using iris hooks and expanders because each one has its role. Uh, another indication of, for iris hooks would be subluxated cataracts where I think you can use asymmetric pupil expansion and you can uh, use them uh, very effectively in subluxated cataracts. Uh, next, I'd invite Dr. Saurabh Patwadhan. He's been a great educator, does a lot of uh, live uh, uh, video transmission or surgeries and he's got a lot of trainees. So Dr. Saurabh Patwadhan will speak on, uh, what are you speaking on? Shallow anterior chamber and small pupil. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suen, sir, and uh, good morning, everyone. Can you make it full screen? It's not getting... Now?
यहाँ तो दिखता है ठीक ओके सो आई थिंक वी हैव लिसन टू वेरी एक्सलेंट टॉक्स एंड आई वुड लाइक टू एड फ्यू थिंग्स द टॉपिक गिवन टू मी इज द शैलो एंटीयर चेम्बर विथ स्मॉल पीपल एंड एज वी नो देर आर डिफरेंट केस सीनेरियोज विथ स्मॉल पीपल आई थिंक बट द शैलो एंटीयर चेम्बर एंड स्मॉल पीपल इज अ डेडली कॉम्बिनेशन बिकॉज वंस वी हैव अ केस विच हैज बोथ then it means that there can be associated zonular weakness in that case because pxf inadequate visualization because of the small pupil plus there are higher risk of iris prolapse if there is a shallow ic there is a higher risk of aqueous misdirection as well as inadequate staining of the capsule and risk of endothelial damage is there so we have this combination to begin with uh, now first thing how to decide uh, whether i will be using iris retractors or i will be using pupil expansion devices in this case so i use this simple test i call it sinski test uh, where i just check for the phacodonesis before i begin the surgery so i just go in with a sinski touch the anterior capsule and try to see whether how much is the movement of uh, the uh, bag is and accordingly i decide whether i should go for iris hook so if the phacodonesis is quite severe then i would like to use iris retractors because in that case i want to see more of periphery uh, in case it requires any more stabilization or if i have to convert it into you know removal of the entire nucleus to scleral tunnel so in that case that is useful to begin with of course you get fair idea when you start the capsulorexis but again uh, once uh, you have started capsulorexis again putting a device may have little bit of difficulty now generally for small pupil devices this is a operated trap very shallow anterior chamber and i am going to stain the uh, anterior capsule under the iris so this is a very useful tip because once you put the ovd it's very difficult to stain the anterior capsule completely so before you expand the ring the capsule is already stained so you don't have to worry about visualization of the capsule later now whenever there is a rigid pupil it's always best to do little bit of stretch pupilloplasty now i don't do the limbus to limbus stretch pupilloplasty anymore but i will do little bit of stretch pupilloplasty and then a pu use a pupil exp uh, expand the device so my choice is always b hex because it's thin profile and it works very well in these cases of shallow anterior chambers where already the working space is very limited so uh, my preferred way to put the b hex is that i put the flange uh, sub incisional flange under the iris so it avoids uh, you know getting trapped while uh, you are injecting the iol uh, now for uh, shallow anterior chamber and small pupil cases many times we land up with very small ccc that should be avoided you should have adequate size of ccc you uh, that is to avoid even uh, later post operative phimosis and even the maneuvers are very difficult if you have very small ccc now uh, we can remove the pupil expansion device under the visco elastic uh, before the visco wash and then you can do a complete visco wash another way to do it is remove entire visco elastic just put little bit of hyaluronate and then uh, remove the b hex and then remove the hyaluronate now this is a, another interesting case of nanophthalmos the ac is extremely shallow hardly 1.2 mm to begin with you can see there are posterior synecae in this case the staining under the caps iris is difficult because of the synecae so i am going to use a cohesive visco elastic here so that i can remove it later easily but here i uh, used the dispersive ovd which could have been avoided so if we use dispersive ovd then to stain under the capsule we again have to use a cohesive underneath or you have to uh, wash the ovd and then again stain so this is a very small cornea this is a nanophthalmic eye and very thin anterior chamber so in this case is also my preferred choice will be b hex so after doing little bit of stretch pupilloplasty it's better to do stretch pupilloplasty if you feel that the pupil is rigid because if pupil is rigid sometimes using pupil expansion device may be little bit of difficult so with just 1.2 to 1.3 anterior chamber there still i could use b hex uh, ring here because of its thin profile iris hooks is another uh, way to deal it but again with a small cornea and small anterior chamber i wanted to avoid four more incisions and then using the iris hooks uh, so uh, putting all the flanges properly before proceeding is very important now again here what i did i uh, in tried to inject the uh, dye under the existing ovd 
and could get good staining but it's best if we use a cohesive OVD or remove the OVD and then stain it again and then put the OVD again. The uh, in nanophthalmic eye typically the lens bag is quite big that is of good uh, normal size and here it was already an intumescent cataract so I had double uh, you know difficulties but I could remove the uh, I could do the CCC very well with uh, use of good OVD and uh, capsule axis forceps. Again here there is always a chance of iris prolapse. I will show it in the next video uh, because with whenever there is shallow anterior chamber there is always a risk of iris prolapse. So in this case so I used a customized IL of 57 diopters. But once we have the pupil expansion devices, good OVDs in hand, even in these small pupil cases with uh, these difficult situations as well, we can achieve very good predictable results. So always in whenever you have a case of shallow anterior chamber and you know very small pupil, be ready with all devices in hand, use the best of OVDs so that uh, you don't have issues. Again, as I was showing, for trailing haptic, you have to be careful with BHEX, not to drag the BHEX along with that. Even if it gets dragged, just you have to make sure that it doesn't go into the capsular bag. Now, uh, in this next case, this was a one-eyed lady, uh, poor vision since childhood. Now, uh, she already had aderent leukoma since childhood, very shallow anterior chamber and mature cataract and I had to deal with uh, uh, this case. So here, what is there? On nasal side, there is aderent leukoma. On the temporal side, very shallow AC because of, I think, both because of the mature cataract and also because of the leukoma there. So here I made a mistake. Just watch what happens. I have stained it under the iris so the dye was trapped under the iris. So when I injected the uh, dispersive agent, it got trapped. So what are the possible causes of shallow anterior, uh, sh uh, the iris prolapse? One of the major cause is shallow anterior chamber. And also if you have made a very short incision, posterior incision, that can uh, cause, sorry, the video has paused. And also raised IOP during the surgery. So make sure that you never raise the anterior chamber pressure during your procedure, make it soft. Uh, and whenever you have uh, any problems, always use the iris retractors or pupil expansion devices. So whenever there is iris pro uh, prolapse, just find out what, what could be the cause amongst these and treat it accordingly. So here, what was the cause was when I injected the dye under the air, some dye got trapped under this uh, iris because of the small pupil. And as I injected the OVD, which was a heavy dispersive OVD, this trapped dye had nowhere else to go and it started pushing the iris out. You can see the trapped dye. So uh, here what, what is most important is that most common intuitive action is to, you know, keep pushing the iris back into the anterior chamber. That should be avoided. First thing is to remove the OVD from the anterior chamber, reduce the anterior chamber pressure and that's what I'm going to do. So I made two side ports here, another two incisions for the iris retractors. And then uh, with biomanual, I'm going to remove the OVD uh, so I have used a heavy dispersive OVD here, so it's very difficult to wash it out. But you can see that dye trapped under the iris the moment it came out. Uh, the anterior chamber pressure was down and now I can push back the iris. So don't, don't try to push back the iris if the anterior chamber pressure is still high. It is going to come out again. Now I'm going to use iris retractors on both sides of the incision. A uh, little posterior incisions were made. Uh, maybe there was a need of one more iris hook. You can see on the nasal side when I tried to put iris hook, iris retractor in fact went behind the iris because there was the adherent leukoma. Nonetheless, the uh, whatever I wanted to achieve was achieved. Here, don't try to uh, keep on pushing the iris back all the time. Use the side incisions to do maximum maneuvers during this case. So I completed the capsular axis from the side incisions there. Uh, avoid hydro dissection in these cases, at least initially. Later, if required, you can do that because hydro dissection will cause further iris prolapse. Now, before inserting the phaco probe, just put a little bit of heavy dispersive OVD over the iris and enter the probe. And uh, try to complete the uh, uh, surgery without taking out the phaco probe. If you want, you can replenish the OVD in between through the side port incisions. So I could achieve a good phaco emulsification as well as uh, irrigation aspiration. Whenever you take out probe in such situations, always make sure you stop the irrigation before taking out the probe. So there is little bit of hypotony which is achieved and then you can remove the probe without much of the iris prolapse. Again, uh, while injecting the IOL, you have to just make sure that the leading edge is not, uh, you know, uh, holding the iris there so as to avoid any iridodialysis. 
again most important thing is to avoid temptation of, of keeping on pressing the iris back into the anterior chamber throughout the surgery just at the end push the iris back and then suture it comfortably and uh, you will get a very good uh, this thing result post operatively rather than trying to push it back all the time so these were few my a few of my tips for shallow anterior chamber and small pupil thank you. combinations thank you sir thank you dr saurav wonderfully covered the whole gamut and uh, the 57 adapter is really scary uh, next we'll invite dr deepak magur uh, for uh, this uh, topic is pseudox foliation and small pupil and of course dr deepak magur uh, requires no introduction his videos have are all over the youtube and uh, it's been educational for all of us dr deepak magur please uh, thank you dr suven for having me on this course i'll be speaking on pseudox foliation and small pupil Uh, as we all know pseudo exfoliation is extremely common and we uh, almost every third or fourth case in our ot list would be having this and uh, it the material is deposited uh, across uh, the uh, anterior segment structures from the anterior capsule to the zonules Display mirror, mirror. Okay, is it on now? Okay. Uh, so, pseudo exfoliation is extremely common. I think, as we all know, every third or fourth patient in our uh, OT list would be having this, and uh, uh, we see these uh, pseudo exfoliation material develop. Uh, dist- placed all over the structures in the anterior segment apart from the anterior capsule to the zonules etc and it has got certain impacts on the iris as well as the zonules so uh, traditionally we have had many uh, ways to deal with this poor metriasis in these eyes starting from using uh, uh, just the intracameral uh, dilating agents which are now available with a combination of topicamide and lidocaine phenylephrine and they work to a certain extent one advantage is they might prevent a little bit of an intraoperative meiosis but their action would be limited they don't give you a consistently well expanded view and uh, obviously the stretch pupilloplasty had been our go to uh, uh, the mechanism for many years now and we used to stretch up to the limbus to ensure that the sphincters get torn and then that would ensure that the pupillary metriasis was maintained throughout the only issue was post operatively you should you would be having a slightly bigger uh, pupil and slightly disfigured of course we also used to resort to this micro sphincterotomies wherein used to be giving my a small sphincterotomy just about maybe 0.5 micron uh, in the pupillary margin and then the only disadvantage is uh, the dilatation would not be great but uh, you could prevent intraoperative metriasis and if you are very careful it, there is not much of a disfigurement as well but these are the days when we did not have uh, pupil expansion devices and uh, the iris hooks have been the gold standard for many years now and the tip is always to make the uh, side port incisions very very short in length so that we can we don't lift up the iris capsule hooks are another one which i use whenever there is an associated zonulary weakness as well as pseudo exfoliation uh capsule looks are the better option uh, instead of other things now coming to uh, the uh, using a ring based pupil based stretching uh, rings uh, in these rigid pupils which are associated with pseudo exfoliation it's mandatory that we have some sort of an expansion so initially we were doing up to the level of the uh, limbus you don't have to do that now important thing is whenever the lens is swollen inject a little bit of viscoelastic underneath the capsule so that we don't damage the anterior capsule trying to manipulate the ring inside so that is one small trick because in many of these cases the intumescent lenses the swell the lens will be very swollen so during the manipulation the rex, the forceps which are using to push in the thing that itself can puncture the capsule just lift up the iris a little bit by using very little amount of uh, ovd and then you can manage a trick again here is to uh, always stabilize the globe with the second instrument this ensures that the globe is not turning around and you are seeing well so that you can implant the ring uh, quite easily So usually 5.5 mm is the expansion which you get with this device and uh, it is really good enough for 
majority of our situations and it also acts as a template for us to get the sizing and centering of the rexis right so it actually you know you can get a perfectly sized well 5 mm rexis and most pseudo exfoliation cases also have associated zonular weakness and whenever i'm dealing with a denser cataract like this i would always like to stabilize the bag early enough by placing the ctr early enough not waiting it to be put later so just create a little bit space under the capsule by giving using ovd and then you can manipulate the uh, ctr very well into the bag and all this is possible because we can see well because we used a uh, pupil expansion device the nucleus division techniques can be uh, of your choice the whatever technique you can use but once you the pupil and the visibility is taken care of the case essentially becomes a routine one so you can focus on other things like you know taking care of the zonular laxity and other things so the importance of seeing well cannot be overemphasized so i am a little bit my threshold is very less whenever i would want to start using a pupil expansion device just for this of course we can do without using any devices but uh, it makes the surgery a little bit more safer uh, this is another one case where you know you can see uh, a very small pupil then cataract uh, again a very little bit of ovd mind you you cannot push a lot of ovd here because there is another side effect which can happen this can go across the zonules into the burgers space and create a sort of a misdirected syndrome because all these pseudo exfoliation eyes have got a compromised zonular barrier as well the fluid can carry across this so be a little bit careful uh, don't push in a lot of fluid or ovd including dye even dye has the ability to percolate across uh, just use very little of the uh, the fluid because this one concept we need to be careful of majority of this will have an anterior halo detachment as well so these can uh, give us posterior misdirection uh, fluid misdirection and cause an intraoperative shallow chamber and other uh, sequelae which can be uh, challenging to manage in the situations so once you because uh, the stretching pre uh, stretching is uh, mandatory for these cases because uh, these are very rigid pupil Uh, unlike what we see in ifis where stretching is in fact contraindicated so once again you are seeing well uh, things will become as if routine you know nothing normal about this case and uh, the all the steps uh, will become routine my only uh, request to suven would be i would want to have a colored bx ring because what happens you know in these eyes in the camera it looks well because i adjust a little bit of a contrast and all in eyes with pseudo exfoliation the cornea is hazy ic is very shallow the bx ring and the iris are of the same color sometimes we don't know whether your hook it notches have engaged the iris or not how i wish you could have something like a green which is totally out from our uh, yeah, the, uh, iris so that is one thing which i would uh, material, see that if it is possible this material comes only in this color yeah that's the only that's thing so that is one thing which uh, is uh, this thing so what are the potential limitations arup sir beautifully told that there are many advantages of using iris hooks certainly but in certain situations my uh, situations i do prefer iris hooks in certain cases a uh, difficult situation where you demand a larger pupil so uh, because especially when i have a rexis which has gone radial i want to see the peripheral part and we have a peripheral you know pc tear sometimes in those situations even if i put in a, P, a bx ring i would remove and then uh, put a, a, a iris hooks like this uh, and convert to sics this situation was at fourth convert and sics and uh, hooks uh, do a great job here so Uh, these are certain situations where we have to be you know uh, having the stock of your iris hooks as well now this is a case where uh, we have created a peripheral postcapsular punch and it is not visible uh, through the 5.5 mm pupil which i always have so in these cases you know i would like to always prefer to use a hook so that i can stretch it up to the limbus and see exactly where the postcapsular tear and ensure that that does not enlarge and i can still go ahead and implant my lens uh, in the appropriate place so other than that i think nowadays uh, the last maybe 5 6 years we are blessed with lot of pupil expansion device that has made our surgery safer and simpler thank you so much for the opportunity thank you dr deepak magur wonderful videos as usual uh, it's a privilege to watch your videos next i'll invite dr minu mathan uh, minu dr minu is a very prolific surgeon has been uh, teaching a lot of people and he does all sorts of surgery i have asked him to speak on sics in small people because that again as a role uh, thank you dr mino for joining us thank you dr suvan and good morning everyone 
people who are leaving i believe they don't do sics in small people or they have other engagements outside but then still we all do sics and just now we saw one video from deepak that uh, uh, when he converts he wants a larger pupil and he will use uh, iris hooks so i'll take it on from there no financial interest so in sics what is our basic problem especially when we have very hard nuclei large nuclei we need a larger rexes and the whole nucleus needs so i'm not talking about grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 which are okay with 5.5 rexes so beyond that if we need to do we need to have larger rexes and the whole nucleus has to come out in this so if we do a relatively small rexes in a case like this and do a hydro dissection and you see the pupil snap here so if it is not adequately decompressed you will find that the the rexes which is smaller will be easily obstructed by the nucleus which lifts up and the fluid will collect behind and it will give way so a small rexes is dangerous when you are when you are doing in and doing an sics with a larger nucleus and uh, you are planning to forcefully hydro dissect and prolapse this kind of a nucleus so we saw before um sort of showed everybody showed stretch pupilloplasty in faco after such pupilloplasty if you don't apply hooks or rings this will become too floppy and it will keep coming into your faco port but in sics is not so see when a nucleus comes out through such a rigid pupil it is anyway going to tear sphincters and it is anyway going to stretch so it will be good to keep it uh, stretched out with multiple sphincter tears which may happen in rigid pupils like this but it won't work in uh, elastic pupils or ifis pupils Uh, when where it will not stretch so in such cases of rigid pupils you have pseudo exfoliation fibrosis and all those try this first it will make it 1 uh, or 2 mm more and if it is good enough in your hands you can proceed without a, a, a dilating device here again it is around 5 mm so if you want a 6 6.5 in this we can do it uh, uh, hands free without the swan by growing under the iris so it's a blind procedure for anybody whoever says however experienced we are it is going to be a blind procedure underneath the iris but the thing is the movement of the needle if you notice two strokes away to the periphery and two strokes towards the center will maintain it under the iris without letting it escape into the periphery so it should not come within the pupillary margin but it should not run away also so two strokes into the periphery and then two strokes back will let it remain under the iris and then retract the iris also along with your um, sinski along with the rexis so that you do not catch the rexis margin when you are prolapsing and the problem again can be because of the pupil being smaller and the nucleus being very large the nucleus can get caught within the pupil and here again a stretch pupilloplasty would do well and putting viscoelastic is very very useful to push the iris around the nucleus by putting viscoelastics and after that this uh, nuclei can be rotated out into the anterior chamber but all these will take a lot of expertise and actually these are not required if you have expanders which are freely available now so my expander one of them definitely goes underneath the main incision the center so this is where it goes and you can notice that it is one is uh, sub incisional so you lift up the anterior flap and see the lip the posterior lip and go posterior limbal and make a small stab incision you can see that these are hooks from grishaber which are uh, marketed by alcon and we don't have any financial interest in any of these but these are actually really small and really malleable you don't need to put a large opening for this as uh, dr arup sir has told regarding the openings and all those i don't want to repeat it but then very small opening less than the size of a 27 gauge needle it can it can go through that so assess your hook which you have and make only that kind of openings don't make large very large openings for unnecessarily and this one will retract the iris away from otherwise if you put it on both sides of the incision every manipulation is going to stretch the iris or or pull on the iris so after this you get uh, here we cannot restrain ourselves to a 5 mm opening because it has to be larger to get a 6.5 this is a 4 grade 4 grade 5 nucleus so and these kind of um, capsules are quite rigid ones they are not then uh, they don't stretch that much also so we need to give an adequate capsular rexus i would give a 6.5 and up to a 7 mm rexus in these kind of cases 
So for that, this kind of a stretch is required and as we saw, we should use uh, capsular excess forceps, you can use uh, high molecular weight viscoelastic to chamber, the, uh, the, to maintain the chamber. Always use uh, uh, the tripen blue to visualize it well and once you have completed, the rexis has to be done under visualization and once it is completed, now you, it's up to you. Uh, hydrodissection or no hydrodissection and prolapse to Sinsky and the type of delivery according to what you are comfortable. The point here is the incisions which you have made should have been at the limbus and it should have been vertical without going into the cornea so that the iris doesn't get pulled up. So iris coming up crowds the anterior chamber and gives less space for the nucleus to come out. And if they are very, very much limbal and if they are taken straight back in the same plane, you will get adequate space even for this kind of a nucleus to be brought into the anterior chamber. Here I am showing uh, a prolapsing without removing any of the hooks. But later on you can release hooks, I will show you those. And after aspirating the cortex only we need to uh, remove or even after IO implantation only you need to remove the iris hooks. Here again it is, this is a quite a large uh, kind, uh, quite a large nucleus and a small. Again I am repeating the incision which is sub-incisional which is very very crucial. And after that I can you can stain underneath the sodium hyaluronate or with air bubble and make a very large capsular excess for because otherwise you are going to get an, uh, get a nucleus and bag delivery together. If you are making a very small rexus, it won't come out or it will break the anterior capsule and you will stretch to the periphery and it will wrap around and cause a posterior capsule rupture. So now I am releasing the sub-incisional one hook. So this will again see I am making sure that the internal incision is quite large, one millimeter more than the external so that the nucleus will definitely easily come out rather than damaging the endothelium. And here, because the iris is down, it is easy to prolapse up the pole which is close to your incision. That is the point of releasing the iris hook there. Once that pole is out and if you rotate 180 degrees, that means the nucleus is very free. The rest of the nucleus which is in the bag, which is nasally, now I am temporarily uh, doing. So nasal part, it will easily come out when you put visco underneath the, rex, uh, the nucleus which is close to you. So with that, the nucleus can easily come out. You need not dial the whole thing out into the anterior chamber also. So this is the final one. This is a mature, hypermature one, though the nucleus is going to be smaller. So again, if you are, if you feel that the iris is crowding up, you can, after doing an adequate rexis, you can release one, two or even three of uh, the uh, hooks once one pole is out. Get one pole out somewhere, get the iris hooks out. I won't take out all those because I will need to reapply this to uh, identify the capsular margin and to take out cortex because once you deliver the nucleus, pupil is going to come down again if you release all these and then you will struggle to find out the cortex and you may leave cortex out. So visualization is very important in these kind of chunk uh, cases where you have chunks of cortex which may stick in the equator and uh, uh, iris retractors have been released now and after delivery that will be put back again and identify the cortex and take out. So in cases where you need to have visualization, and to do an adequate rexis, please use iris retractor hooks to identify the periphery and do an adequate rexis to have a safe SICS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mino. Wonderfully covered entire uh, SICS and really a large variety of cases. I'd invite you to join us over here and we have about seven minutes to take any questions. Be happy to, the panel will be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the audience? Uh, would the panel like to raise any questions, discuss anything? Deepak, you were uh, talking about the uh, color of the device. Yes, we've been struggling with that. Uh, the problem is made of polyamide. And polyamide or uh, the particular brand that we use, the global standard. We need a particular standard mechanical properties. That comes only in that uh, amber color. Can you coat it with anything? No, we can't. Stain it with anything? It will start, if the coat starts peeling off during surgery, it's going to be very embarrassing for you. That is true. That is uh, true. So that we tried, we tried another... Yeah, I was also asking him about mm. the color. Uh, yeah, not even, lots of people. And I got a standard response on WhatsApp, which I forward. Actually, uh, we tried a black color, but then the mechanical properties were not good. Uh, so we, I, that was in the prototyping stage, so I gave it up. So right now we have with this, we'll be going forward, uh, we may try to. Anything else? Dr. Prakash, you'd like to raise a question or make a comment about some other, no, other topics? <laughs> about other topics, other things? Uh, I think it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
I uh, spoke about uh, ideas sooks and uh, there are a few points uh, I thought I'd emphasize. You know, sometimes you know when it is a very deep set tie, you know, very shallow orbit and uh, I mean very deep set. So in that situation, the the hap the ideas sooks may become a little messy. You know, in that case, you can trim off the the extended portion of the hook so that you know the manipulations do not get affected. So that is one thing which I think I forgot to uh, communicate during my presentation. I think uh, one message that I give to all my trainees and fellows is that many times when I ask uh, you know any of my fellow uh, about a complication, what was your analysis? They start with the pupil became small and then you know I had this complication. So I feel that small pupil should not be an excuse for a complication because we have so many now devices and iris. It's just many times the mind block of uh, many beginner surgeons that they don't use any iris hooks or devices and just continue to do the surgery in the same way and land up with complications. So this is the line, small pupil should not be an excuse for a complication anymore. Absolutely agree with you Dr. Saurabh because I, I always keep urging surgeons to lower your threshold for using a device, have at least iris hooks on your tape because if you look at it, if you do have a complication, the time that you gained not using a device is really goes down the drain. Because if you have a complication, it's another half an hour at least that's gone in that surgery. And the results are definitely contrary to your expectations. So you're in a mess. So you'd rather uh, spend some time, a few minutes extra, uh, and people who are proficient using iris hooks or pupil expanders, if you spend just about a minute more, and uh, it, it, I think, brings a lot of safety, adds a lot of safety to the... Surgery. Yeah, because if you spend one minute more, that one minute anyway, you're going to spend more in FECO in a small pupil. Exactly. You're going to retract the iris, it will delay that. So, always use that uh, whenever you feel that that pupil is not good enough in my hands. That is my point. And uh, uh, the wrong notion of uh, these uh, rings or hooks cannot be used in topical patients. I've heard it from some people, that's why I'm making it clear. There is nothing like that. Even if you feel that if there is some pain or something, if you retract, just put uh, intracameral um, uh, lignocaine, which is easily available now, and uh, that will clear off everything. So any stage, topical phaco, rings or hook can be applied. Yes. yes. I think Minu has put a very good point. You know, that is something I forgot to emphasize. See, intraoperatively, when the people become small, uh, if, if the patient has cooperated for topical anesthesia, you have selected that patient, Subsequent manipulation do not make any difference and you can definitely take up the patient. I mean, patient don't even realize the difference. It is the surgeon's uh, safety factor, comfort factor. We've actually grown up with the uh, teaching that uh, if you touch the iris, it becomes painful. Well, it doesn't. We've been using iris hooks in the topical anesthesia for many years. One tip for using iris hooks is uh, when you use one of the hooks, use that as the lead for your next hook. Because once you've tented it up, you can you get the plane very easily. So go under that and then you bring it to that particular radial. So you use that, so every successive hook you can use that way and that helps you. Uh, sometimes if you have a tight situation where you're close to the, it's a shallow antechamber and you're, uh, you can't differentiate it between the iris plane and the capsular, capsular rim, it's a good idea to use a second instrument and tent up the iris over there and then use the hook to engage. And once you've engaged one hook, you got that plane, you got a tented area so you can do all the other hooks one after the other. So and I think one thing actually yeah. I in my clinical practice if there is any history of using tamsinolosins and if I found that there is a during irrigations there is a dunching and flapping more the movement I don't take any risks I don't just want to foot the yeah uh, absolutely periods. I think that well, we should lower our threshold because there is no there is no reason and if you look at it I would always say if you are the patient you are undergoing cataract surgery you have a four millimeter people what do you want the surgeon to do use his heroic surgical skills or use a device I think you have your answer. So and basically, still, still better if you think it's your mother in law going on the surgery. No, I would definitely agree with Suvan and Prakash. See, if the uh, dilated PL ratio is less than 60%, and I mean, intuitively, in, initially you can titrate by real measurements with your in, intuition, and then it really works mo well most of the time. If it is less than 60%, you know, I would definitely go ahead with uh, you know, Iris Hook. Thank you. I think with that, we'll come to close. We just got just one minute left, so we'll finish in time. Thank you very much, Dr. Prakash, Dr. Menu, Dr. Aru. Dr. Saurabh and Dr. Deepak, look forward to having you next year and thank you on the audience for being here early in the morning. Thank you very much.